and welcome back to Spiritual Strength. Today I'm here with a very special guest, His Eminence Cardinal Burke. Your Eminence, thank you very much for joining us. I'm glad to be with you, Gene, and to be a little assistance with your work. Absolutely. If you could please start us off with a prayer. Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we ask you to bless us and to bless the recording which we are now making, so that it be for your greater honor and glory, and also will assist souls for their eternal salvation. Bless all of our works, and uh, may they all lead us to grow ever more in the image of your only begotten Son, to become strong and faithful in him. We ask this in his name, who is with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Your Eminence. You're welcome. So, I wanted to do a different show than maybe a lot of people have seen before. I know a lot of people have seen you on different shows, and a lot of times it's speaking about the crisis in the world, the crisis in the church. And of course, it's important to speak about that. But even getting back to just some more basic morality and a lot of questions that I may have or, or questions that I speak about topics with my family, with my friends. And quite frankly, I'd like some of them to watch the show and hear it from you rather than for them to continue hearing it from me. Maybe they'll listen. So I, <laughs> I appreciate your help with this. So the first, the first topic, just being about the news in general. I remember watching you before saying something that too much negativity is bad for the human soul and how a lot of the news simply can't be trusted. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yes, there, there's no question that there, there's plenty of bad news to go around, bad news in the world and sadly also in the church. Uh, and But for us to, to dwell on everything that's going wrong becomes uh, after a while uh, paralyzing for us. We. We feel so helpless. We feel there's nothing we can do about it. The, the, the difficulties are all so great. And we can easily lose sight of the fact that we're always in the hands of God, that divine providence is always at work. And uh, also, we lose sight of all the good news. And I frequently uh, remind myself and remind others of, of the many signs of holiness of life in our time of uh, uh, young families with children who are very devout and are striving to educate their children in a life of prayer, educate them also uh, soundly uh, so that they will grow up to be uh, good and faithful members of the church and good and faithful citizens. And so uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, yes, we recognize uh, the things that are wrong, but we need to also see that and renew our frequently our confidence in divine providence, placing all these things in God's hands, recognizing also the blessings that he gives us and thanking him for that. And then finally, uh, each of us does contribute to, to peace in the world, to the resolu resolution of the difficulties in the church by putting our own household in order, uh, by as one image is used, by tending our own garden in a way so that it, it bears good fruit. And when each of us is doing that, uh, that's going to transform society and it certainly is going to build up the body of Christ in strength. As I already said, we're all members of his mystical body. And, and so what we do as individual members builds up uh, the, the whole body. And uh, so that's why I frequently say to, to others and I remind myself, uh, not to dwell excessively on on all of the bad news. As I say, there's plenty of it. Uh, yes, to be aware of it, to pray for God's help, but then to trust, to have hope uh, in his mercy, and, uh, and then to do our own part. Uh, as you said at the beginning of the program, uh, and I, I like the idea very much, you want to address today practical questions of how to live as a good Catholic uh, because in the end, that's what is our is our first duty is to to be good and faithful members of the church, good and faithful to our Lord's life within us.
Absolutely. And as you said about trust, knowing who to trust versus who not to trust and, t- and trusting God and his Catholic church and the teachings of all time, that's where our trust should be rooted. And a lot of times people think, well, just because it's on the news, then we have to believe it. It's all of a sudden fact. Mm. And that cannot be possible if it's in contradiction with the Catholic church. And some of the things just don't make sense. So can you comment on that a little bit? Yes. Like right now, there's a lot on the blogs, at least, and somewhat too in the in the general uh, press uh, that the church is going to teach change its teaching on on the use of contraception in in marriage, and uh, uh, this is fomented by various uh, things that have been said or done. But the the truth of the matter is that the church can't change its teaching on artificial contraception, that the church has always and everywhere held that it was wrong to to interfere with the conjugal act uh, in in any way to remove uh, its essentially uh, procreative dimension. And so uh, uh, that would would be just one example, but there are others as well. Uh, And we, we need to be serene. We need to be calm, uh, and, uh, and and trust that our Lord is not going to permit His Church to to abandon the faith. He's with us. He promised that He would be with us always until the end of time, and that He's with us now in these troubled times, and that He will even if He permits for a time certain confusion to enter in, or even uh, people in, who are in authority to say things that are in error. Uh, that he will, in the end, always protect his church, and uh, and uh, that the victory is always his in the end. Right, and as you said about uh, contraception never being morally permissible because God doesn't change, so right. the morality never changes. Can you speak about that just generally? That as Catholics, our faith is all or nothing. So right. logically, either the Holy Spirit is protecting the church and all of her teachings or not. So if you're saying you're a Catholic, you can't be a cafeteria pick and choose. I think this is better in some situations. Can you speak about that? Yes, I think because in, in society in general, there's this idea that uh, that we can make reality according to our own likes and, uh, and preferences and that laws can be made which don't respect the nature of things. But for us as Catholics, uh, we believe that God revealed himself, reveals himself to us in two ways. First of all, when he calls us into being, he writes his law in our own hearts. We all have a conscience uh, that uh, when it's rightly informed, alerts us to what is good uh, in order that we do it and alerts us to what is evil in order that we to avoid it. And then uh, infinitely uh, more beautifully and, uh, and lovingly, God is reveal the the truth to us, uh, the same truth uh, through divine revelation, through the Holy Scriptures and through the sacred tradition of the church of which the Holy Scriptures are a part so that we know that what the church is always and everywhere taught uh, never changes. And for us, the important thing is to understand more deeply what the church's teaching is and to live according to it, uh, not to be seeing how we can change that teaching, which of course we cannot, and if we if we do try to change it, we just bring upon ourselves uh, uh, condemnation and also uh, bring other troubles up, uh, upon ourselves, which are always the results of sin. And uh, so that is uh, uh, now there's all this talk about synodality, about the synodal church and so forth. And in Germany, this has caused a tremendous confusion and also a deviation from essential church teaching. And uh, so people think that somehow the synodal church, that we all get together and we vote on what we believe or we vote on what's right and wrong. Well, that's completely false. Uh, Our life in Christ is a gift. Uh, The goodness is a gift from God. And we need to understand what is good and right and then do it uh, according to what our, our Lord teaches us in the church. And that's that's all there is to it, and uh, so there's no uh, uh, for that reason too. I, I I trust that this whole notion of synodality 
uh, will will eventually people realize that this is uh, it does not have to do with this essential nature of the church and and won't be led astray by it. Right. Unfortunately, I see this a lot of well-meaning Catholics, or at least nominal Catholics, family and friends, where they think it's it, it's more majority rules. And yes. then we, the church has to get with the times. And obviously, when it comes to faith and morals, that's impossible because God doesn't change. No, I hear that, too, from good people. They say, well, the bishop wants us to come together for meetings to decide about the church's teaching with regard to uh, whether it be sexual morality or, or whatever it might be. And well, no, the, if the bishop's calling you together, it's to to teach you and to that we all strive to see more clearly what that teaching is and live it, perfect our living of it, not not change it or try to adapt it to a, a world which we have simply to recognize that that in society, uh, the most fundamental tenets of the natural law of that law that God has written on our hearts, the law contained in the Ten Commandments, which our Lord uh, taught in the Beatitudes and by his whole life and continues to teach in the church, uh, society in general is attacking it in its most fundamental tenets. We see it with the whole horrible scourge of, of procured abortion. We see it in the attack on the family, a marriage in the family, this idea that we can have marriages between two people of the same sex and such things. And now the attack on, on religious freedom that that people, the, the law is trying to force uh, good people to act against their conscience, either with regard to human life or the marriage in the family. And, uh, and that's an attack on, on the free practice of our, our religion. And that is absolutely wrong. So that we, we have to, in the church, we have to be assigned to the whole society of what is the way out of all of this confusion. And the way out of it is to recognize God and to recognize his presence in our lives, his law, and to, to live accordingly. Right. And unfortunately, what I, what I hear from a lot of people, they'll say, well, they don't understand the importance of the church. They get They get the importance of morality, but they'll say, I believe that ultimately, if you're a good person... God's going to take you to heaven. And, well, we have to follow God's teachings. God came to earth and told us what to do, be part of his church. And can you speak about the importance of, of, of that, of the Catholic church, and that it's not just, our faith is not just built on being a good person, but it's the grace of Jesus Christ. Yes, well, the, the fact of the matter is that all of us are are born with the uh, stain of original sin and even after we're baptized and come alive in Christ we suffer from the effects of original sin and without the grace of Christ we are not going to be a good person that simply is the is the truth uh, and we we need the help of it, of his life within us that otherwise why did Christ come why did God the son come and become man and why did he he uh, suffer and die on the cross rise from the dead uh, send to the right hand of the Father, send the Holy Spirit, except for one reason, that we need his grace in order to be saved. And uh, and that's, uh, uh, and so, yes, it's true. Uh, if you're a good person, God will save you. But to be a good person, you need to be alive in Christ. And, uh, uh, and, and this is, and once you understand that, uh, there's no other way for you than to, to embrace Christ, to follow him, to take up the cross with him daily, as our Lord himself says, and and to restrain the wrong desires, which are a sad inheritance from the original sin of our first parents, and at the same time to cooperate with, with divine grace to be a truly good person, a person who, who loves God and others by doing what is right and just. Right. And, and we see this then emerge, this moral relativism. And a lot of times they don't even mean this. They don't even understand really what relativism is or, or how or how it is. But a lot of times you speak about the faith. And the first thing they say is, well, I feel or I think. And that's a red flag because is what does the church teach? Yes. Well, this is, uh, 
you know, the exaltation of the individual and this idea is you have your truth and I have my truth. And if they contradict each other, that doesn't make any difference. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's not a question of how I feel or, or what, what I think in my own little world, but it, it's to think and to feel with Christ. In other words, to, to form one's mind and heart according to the truth and the love of, of Christ, which comes to us through the sacraments and our prayer and devotions. And uh, uh, then uh, when we when we conform our minds to the mind of Christ and unite our hearts to his heart, then we find that we are we are one with one another. And, and, uh, and there's there's first of all peace in our own life together. We we know what's right and good. And even if we don't always do it, everyone understands what it is and we can help one another to to do better, to reform our lives, to lead, live more faithfully. Uh, but otherwise, we're lost in our own world. And uh, whenever we close in on ourselves, then Satan has uh, uh, free free space to do whatever he wants. Because without without Christ, we can't pretend that we're going to be able to overcome the evil which which is in the world and which also wants to enter into our hearts. Satan wants to enter into our hearts. Our Lord was very severe about this. He he said uh, to the, in his public ministry, and they would find it in the Gospel of John. He said, uh, "Satan is a murderer. He hates man because." God has chosen man, uh, earthly creature, made him in his own image and likeness, redeemed him by uh, the saving passion and death of our Lord. So he hates man. He's a murderer from the beginning, and he's a liar and the father of lies. So he's always, even as he did with Adam and Eve, he's going to insinuate lies to us, telling us that we can be like God and we can do whatever we want. And every time man has done that, there's nothing, the result is always violence, destruction, death. Right. And and knowing that following Christ's teachings, we were never promised earthly or temporal happiness. That's not the goal of our faith. It's, it's eternal happiness. And that living according to the teachings of the church sometimes is going to be difficult, but it's important for us to persevere with the truth, even if it might offend people, even though we're not trying to offend them. The concrete example, I, one of the examples I think of is sometimes attending these, these weddings, these marriages that aren't actually marriages, whether they're same sex or two Catholics being married outside of the church or a Catholic marries a non-Catholic and there's no approval by the bishop or following the canonical process. And that then we're as Catholics, well, what, what should we do as Catholics if we're invited to those weddings? Yes, well, we have to do what uh, in conscience is correct. And if it's a marriage, which is not a true marriage, for instance, two people of the same sex pretending to, to, be, to be married or, or a Catholic not celebrating marriage according to the canonical form, as we call it, not celebrating the church, the marriage in church uh, before uh, the priest and witnesses, uh, then... We can't assist at such a marriage because it would, if, if we were, it were to us at marriage, I put in quotation marks because, for instance, these are not, the church doesn't recognize them. And in truth, they're not marriage. We can only be married uh, uh, as Catholics in Christ and according to uh, the requirements of the sacrament of marriage in the church. So we, we should not assist at such weddings. Now, the, the difficulty then comes in. If we don't assist at the wedding, how do we show the people that we still love them? We don't we we don't accept what they've done; uh, it's wrong, uh, but we still we still love them and we want to be close to them with the hope that by showing them Christ-like love, they will recognize uh, uh, what that recognize that their marriage is not in Christ. And, and rectify the situation, whatever it may be. Obviously, uh, two people of the same sex can, can never have a marriage. Catholic will enter marriage 
or attempts to enter a marriage without following the, the form that the church requires can then have the marriage rectified, blessed. Uh, but so what to do? And uh, in such a circumstance, I think to write uh, a, a serene note, simply saying that uh, I, I cannot in conscience be present for your marriage, uh, for for this ceremony or whatever it may be. Uh, but I want you to know that I still love you very much and that I uh, want only what is for your good. And for that reason, I have to act according to my own conscience and, and not be present. Sometimes right. uh, I remember a sad situation of parents, very devout Catholics. In fact, they had three children who... Uh, one is in the convent, in a contemplative convent. Another one is in a monastery. But the, the third child is got involved in in a disordered friendship, and then proposed to have this uh, so-called marriage with another person of the same sex. And, and the parents told her that they couldn't do that. It was. And she said, well, you, you don't respect my conscience. And, and uh, I said, well, then you need to say to her, but, but you don't respect uh, the mind of Christ and of, of his church and that we have to follow. And, and that's, the, uh, that's what, as we say, defines the question. That's what uh, gives us the right direction. So in, in all of this, I, I think the important thing is we should be very serene. We're, we're following the teaching of the church. Sometimes we get worked up, and if these things are emotionally very disturbing, That's especially right. when they're people who are in our own family, we love them very much, and, and we don't understand how they got off in this way of thinking. Or, but that's the way it is. Uh, so, but I think we remain serene, but also clear uh, to them, giving giving witness to the truth, uh, but in a loving way that's the best we can do it. it the, the situations are, are difficult, uh, but uh, uh, we, this is, how else does Christ call us to give witness uh, to our faith except in such circumstances? Even as in other circumstances, if we're part of a conversation which is uh, uh, not correct or either with lies or not, not decent or whatever, we have to uh, we have to say we're not taking part in, in such a conversation. Uh, in other circumstances, too, we, we wouldn't take part in doing something that wasn't wasn't correct. So also in this case, and even more importantly, because it has to do, marriage has to do with the eternal salvation of, of the partners. And so uh, uh, that's even more, how should we say, more critical. Right. And Christ, even while he was on this earth, even spoke directly to that there there could be and probably will be some family tension and that oh, yes. you have to put, he said, love the Lord with all your heart. That's the first commandment. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And that order wasn't haphazard. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of people say, well, family first, just as more of a catchphrase. And yes, of course, our family is of utmost importance, but the love of God even precedes that sure it's the love of god that makes the family and uh, uh yes the family has certain rights but they come from god and they're uh and those that uh, god's plan for the human family has always to be respected and uh and honored in every way and uh, what does it say about our respect for the family if we would try to enter a marriage without uh, doing so before Christ and in his church, uh, what would it say about our our respect for the family to uh, attempt some kind of so-called marriage with a person of the same sex? Right. Now, could you speak about servile work on Sunday? We have to keep Sunday holy and dedicated towards God. Now, that's a lot of people are, are very confused and I don't even know if a lot of, I know there's many people not doing this, but can you speak about the work outside, basically the cutting of the grass, the lawn maintenance, sports, 
shopping? What's the cleaning the house? What's the extent of what we can and can't do on Sunday? Well, Sunday is to be a day of rest. It's an imitation of our Lord's rest on the seventh day after he had created the earth. We are called to, we are the image of God and we imitate him also in this way that we need a day of rest. We need a day in which uh, we uh, worship God in a very, uh, we worship God every day. We pray to him, and uh, but on Sunday to, to observe the Lord's day, uh, by being at Holy Mass, also uh, uh, taking time for prayer during the day, special prayer, even in the, especially in the family. Uh, and then to, to rest, not to be about uh, our, our, our daily uh, work, whatever it may be. And in, in the past, uh, uh, even companies, now some work required, for instance, if you were, I grew up on a dairy farm, well, you had to milk the cows every day. You couldn't sit, uh, fail to do that. So that was necessary to do, but you didn't do other things like bring in crops, things that were not required. Uh, uh, and so too, uh, you, you uh, the mother is going to, or sometimes it's the father, maybe it's the father, mother, they are going to prepare a Sunday dinner and things like that. Those things are, of course, all, part of the of observing the Lord's Day. They're not servile labor, but we we should as much as possible, both for ourselves and for others, to the degree that we have some uh, control over the situation, uh, make it that the tasks that are not necessary to be carried out on Sunday uh, uh, would be avoided so that people have freedom to, to be with our Lord, freedom to uh, to rest and to uh, when we rest we see our lives more clearly more more according with God's God's will Sunday was also a time some when families would go on maybe a little pilgrimage to a sacred place or uh, some other activity which uh, uh, renewed the whole sense of the of our faith in God and in the sound family life. But those are our judgments that have to be made. Now, when, when I was growing up in the 1950s, the stores were not open on Sunday and because it wasn't necessary for them to be open. Well, I suppose somebody said they ran out of milk or whatever and they needed to get some. Well, they, there might be a some little store that where they could or borrow from a neighbor, um, but and generally now, of course, everything is open and and in uh, and, and all these malls and so forth. And I think that's not healthy uh, to on Sunday to be doing shopping, which we can do on other days of the week, or uh, or just going uh, doing all kinds of commercial things. We should try to limit that as much as possible. I don't know if that's helpful or absolutely. It would it would seem that. If, if you absolutely needed something from the store, you, you could get for the family prep, preparing a meal or you have a guest. Okay, yes, they can get, a uh, family can get that. A mother or father can go out to the store, but that wouldn't be the day to do your shopping. Or no. the grocery no. You know, in, in fact, the shopping should be done on, on Saturday or whenever in preparation for Sunday. And it, of course, we're all are forgetful or, we can make a mistake, and so we forgot to to buy the milk or whatever. Okay, then that can be rectified. But as you say, uh, one of the parents can go out and do that. It's not time for the whole family to be out shopping, right? Or or go or even going to shops or going through the mall. Even if you're at the mall, just looking around, that really wouldn't be the day for that. Um, no, it's very it, it's very materialistic. It's it 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 it. it I don't see how maybe I, I'm missing something, but I don't see how going to a mall is, is going to inspire thoughts about God and about our faith. It just seems they're all, they're not bad things necessarily, but they are things we are concerned about on other days of the week. And on Sunday, we're even concerned for our, for God and for our faith and life in him. And so I think it's just better to avoid that. 
Right. And, and home maintenance, lawn maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, your property, it would be if you absolutely had to. But most of the time you don't need to. I mean, if something spills, you could vacuum that up. Sure. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't be the day to do your cleaning of the home. That wouldn't be the day to do all your yard work. Right. And we have every uh, every means to organize our lives in such a way we mow the lawn on one of the other days of the week. We, uh, As you say, if there's an emergency, a pipe bursts or, or something spills, of course, we, we correct it. But uh, these are extraordinary things and not the ordinary maintenance of the home. Um, uh, and you, uh, you, we're, we're amazed when we really observe the Lord's Day, uh, the beauty it brings into our lives and uh, a joy, uh, a sense of, uh, of of good order and sometimes situations that are not easy. You talked before rightly about the fact that God never promised us that following him was going to be easy or it was painless or, uh, as they say, a, a cakewalk. The... Uh, our Lord said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you will not have life. And so we know that we have a lot of things to face, but our Lord gives us this day in which to refresh ourselves, revitalize ourselves, and to see that there's real beauty in our daily life, uh, uh, even in the suffering, because it is an expression of love. We, we Parents suffer for the good of their children. Spouses suffer for the good of each other. Uh, we suffer to we make sacrifices to help one another, uh, to do other things, other good works. And, and that Sunday just puts it all in perspective for us. And so we, we understand that even suffering in this life uh, brings us joy. Uh, first of all, because we, we're loving God and our neighbor. Secondly, because we're anticipating the eternal happiness of heaven. And, and now working with athletes, many of them, exer we, we exercise, I, I exercise on, on many Sundays. Um, I, there's, there's tournaments for sports. How should we approach that? If that's not something I should be doing, I don't want to do that. And as athletes, how do they keep the su Sunday holy? Should they be participating in these sports competitions? Sometimes that's the only time they offer them. Yes, I. Uh, first of all, uh, exercise and athletic contests uh, can be very spiritual. Saint Paul uh, uses frequently images from the world of, of of exercise in order to become strong, or the world of sports, fighting the good fight, staying the course. Uh, and so, in and of themselves, these things can be good, and also. To, for instance, to do some exercise on Sunday is certainly appropriate, or to take a long walk, or oftentimes two families went on hikes and things like that on a Sunday. So it can be a very, very healthy spiritual thing. Uh, it is too bad, uh, in my judgment, that, for instance, in schools and other uh, organizations, the practices are scheduled on Sundays and even on the most holy days of the year, like Good Friday, uh, and, and, and requiring the young people to be absent, even during times when they should be in church. Uh, and uh, for in Sunday morning, the young people should, that should be for church. And but so I think we need to get that straightened out. And, uh, uh, you know, and there's no need for that. The, the, the athletes can be well prepared uh, for their contests uh, by exercising or having practices at, at times other than uh, other than Sunday. Now, of course, the professional sports, that's another thing. If you're uh, a player for the, for the Kansas City Chiefs or somebody like a, a team like that, then you, you, you're going to have to also provide your uh, services also on Sunday, but then a person can, when he has to play on Sunday or something, can take another day in the week to to try to give our Lord more time. And still in in that, and I, I see I don't have a lot of acquaintance with professional teams, but I know that a number of them they make provision for the players to to participate in Holy Mass. 
there's a chaplain also that they can talk with and so forth and seek counsel with. And so anyway, uh, but we, uh, I think that the important thing to do would be to, uh, to emphasize uh, uh, the spiritual dimension of, of sports. The, uh, this is a good thing, uh, uh, but it, that it has to also respect uh, the holy days and the holy times. Right. And now when it comes to um, masses now in a post-COVID world, we see very frequently there, there's still many churches having car masses, the people sitting in their car during the holy sacrifice of the mass, as well as there, there's also many people who are were older, they're not going to mass, they've gotten in the habit of watching it on TV, yet they go other places. Can you speak to that, that really they should be at mass and inside the church and that the car masses really wouldn't be appropriate? Right. The, uh, sadly, there's been a lot of poor uh, catechesis, a poor instruction in the faith now for several decades, and and people can have the mistaken notion that the mass is like a, a spectacle that you can watch on television. And and add even people say to me that they they like the mass better on television because they could be in their easy chair, and uh, you know. But the when what does the what does our faith tell us about the mass? It tells us that at the mass in the church at the altar, Christ Himself is acting. the The priest is acting the person of Christ. Christ is present there, re, renewing sacramentally His uh, sacrifice on Calvary uh, for our salvation, and so. And that doesn't happen on television. Yes, you can have holy thoughts and so forth, but you're you're not there with Christ. Christ is not coming to you through the through the television. And so, as soon as we can, we want to be back in the church. And uh, uh, this we this has to be corrected because. Uh, and then, what's happened with a number of people? After a while, if you're watching on television, there isn't anything very compelling about that. In other words, you know, it's not the direct encounter with Christ that you have when you're at Holy Mass. And then people just stop going to Sunday Mass at all. And that's truly sad. Right. And that was the final point I was going to bring up of this show is that then a lot of times what people do because their priest, their pastor permits this, they think it's okay. Or if their bishop if if says something that might be contrary to the Catholic faith, or even possibly the Pope saying something that contradicts the timeless teachings of the church, they say, well, the Pope said it, or a bishop said it, or my pastor said it. Can you just speak finally about that, that not every single word that ever, that the Pope says, or even priests or bishops, it has to be conformed to the church teachings? Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, all of us, are held to be obedient to the truths of our faith, beginning with the Holy Father down to the rank and file Catholic. Uh, there, there are none of us who 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 make doctrine, who make church discipline on our own. We're we're doing what Christ is teaching us and asking of us in the church. And Saint Paul said at the beginning of the letter to the Galatians, he said, even if an angel from heaven would come announcing something different from what I've taught you. Let that angel be anathema. Let that angel be excommunicated. And so uh, we, and in the past, uh, pastors in the church, beginning with the Holy Father, with bishops and so forth, and priests, uh, they didn't pronounce uh, a lot on, on different questions because they taught the catechism and the sermons and so forth. And, uh, and then when they did pronounce, they were very careful to align what they said with those documents of our faith, which are our sure guide. And so, for instance, if if the Pope on an on an airplane, an airplane airplane interview makes some kind of offhand remark about something, that is that's not official teaching. It, it's the, it's the Pope is both a man and he's the vicar of Christ on earth. When he speaks as the vicar of Christ on earth, it is with a great solemnity, and very clearly so. But as a man, he can have all kinds of thoughts that aren't particularly uh, compelling for any of us. Uh, and, and that simply a fact matters. It's not disrespectful to him, uh, but 
uh, and that's why, as I say, it uh, uh, in general, the Holy Father, bishops, and all of us, priests, cardinals, whoever it may be, we should be careful to when we speak the, that we set forth uh, what the church has always taught and practiced. Your Eminence, thank you very much for your time. I greatly cool. value your friendship. I greatly value oh, yes. the friendship of your family. Thank well, you for everything that you do. Well, thank you so much. And I pray for you every day. And please keep me in your prayers and greetings to all your family. I will, Your Eminence. If you could please mm -hmm. close us with a blessing. Yes. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Gene. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye.